you very much. So uh, thanks so much for organizing the event and for all that I've learned and enjoyed in the presentations that we've seen so far. Um, my, the work I'm going to present, I hope, is complementary. I'm sure it's slightly different. Uh, I'm going to present a series of, I, I'm going to present a theory about why vernacular landscapes uh, are important ar archetypes for the design of green infrastructure. I'm going to describe a series of empirical studies that I've done over the last 25 years that support that theory in some ways. And then I'm going to show a little bit of experimental built work that has allowed us to see how these theories might work on the ground. So uh, what I want to ask you to consider is that for green infrastructure in particular, vernacular landscapes are powerful archetypes for design. Let me say that using the words you see on the right to emphasize what I mean by that. That is common pervasive landscapes. That's what I mean by vernacular. Common pervasive landscapes are uh, effective patterns to copy for the design of green infrastructure. Why? Because green infrastructure needs to be pervasive itself in order to function to clean stormwater and people making common everyday decisions about the design and management of landscapes are largely the effectors of that landscape pattern. So for us as designers to get inside their heads and get inside their values and understand what they're looking for is, I would argue, essential to the real sustainability in the sense of the long-term function of green infrastructure. So because stormwater is pervasive, like vernacular uh, values and norms are, if we can match our design innovations, and I want to emphasize, I'm talking about innovations, not merely copying what we find, but innovating with what we observe. If our innovations can match what people value, then perhaps our uh, insights as designers can extend across, say, on the left, the entire Mississippi River Basin. I edited a book called From the Corn Belt to the Gulf, where we aspire to affect the landscape patterns, including agriculture, across that whole Mississippi basin in order to ameliorate the dead zone that we live with every year and that gets bigger every year now because of pollutants that are flushed down the river. At the same time, in this smaller watershed in St. Paul, this urban watershed that you see on the right, it's this pattern of the most commonplace, and we might think our ecological design eyes might see the most egregious kinds of patterns that people love that are uh, putting stormwater downstream at risk and compromising it. But how can we, as designers, uh, strategically understand and use those patterns to affect these entire watersheds? And furthermore, how can policymakers understand this to affect entire watersheds? I have to say as a sidebar that I'll, I will touch on again at the end, we all understand that the Clean Water Act is essentially only affecting urban watersheds so that we could do our very best work in urban watersheds and that Mississippi River Basin would still be just dumping pollutants down the river. So this is partly a policy issue in understanding how to affect all the landscapes that feed streams, lakes, and even the ocean. J.B. Jackson, you know, the, the great master of understanding ver vernacular landscapes, described that vernacular landscapes are the product of local custom, pragmatic adaptation to circumstances, and unpredictable mobility. So he understood the potential for innovation and change in vernacular landscapes. Here are those two examples again, the exurban lawns running uh, precisely down to the stream and the massive monoculture of the Iowa landscape I just showed you. Yes, those are two vernacular patterns, but so is this. So is this a landscape that employs vernacular patterns, and I'll, I think I'll explain why it's vernacular better. So is this, though it's in Tromsø, Norway, 
it gives us an idea about how vernacular patterns and ownership of a home could adapt and be recognizable and still change. And so is this in Flint, Michigan. This may not look like sustainable design, but I would argue there are many clues there that we can employ to construct sustainable designs. In the agricultural landscape, this landscape exists 100 miles from the one we just saw that has lots of perennial cover on it because of the conventions for production. And this one exists in Tampa, Florida, uh, employing uh, norms for the appearance of landscape that we can use in other ways. So I would suggest that we use this, think of this as visual evidence of people's values and norms and think about how we can strategically lift from this visual evidence uh, sustain patterns that will be sustained and that will manage stormwater over time. So why? Because the vernacular is immediately recognizable. I would suggest that to develop patterns that work across watersheds, we need to design patterns that everybody gets. And everybody gets them not because they are exactly the same as the way it's always been, but because it draws on characteristics that people continue to recognize as valuable. So this sprawl landscape is one that we included in a, in a web survey project I'll touch on later. And at least our 600 exurban Michigan homeowners got the value of this landscape equally as well as they get the value of that landscape. So we have choices if we work with the vernacular and perhaps can be more confident that our design choices will be sustained over time when we're no longer part of this. So I've dubbed this the cultural sustainability cycle. And I developed this idea in a book that was published in 97 called Placing Nature. The gist of this, if you uh, look to the, to the right, is that our knowledge as designers and policymakers of cultural values and cultural norms as they look in the landscape helps us be powerful in proposing landscape designs that interpret these values and going across the landscape circle there, uh, can employ what we know from environmental sciences um, to build those values into the landscape. So the cultural norms and values help us promote environmental health and ecosystem services by strategic, inventive interpretations of the values in a way that then embody the values and you get a positive feedback loop, a positive feedback loop between norms and what we know about environmental science. What, how can this feedback loop be, science, be uh, positive? Because of design, because of the way we interpret these values. And in particular, one thing that I've found, and I'm gonna talk a bit about these empirical studies, time and time and time again, and many, many studies having uh, data from by now thousands of people, is that the way people read care in the landscape is determinative of their response. It is an essential. Why? Because care connotes civility or neighborliness. You look at a landscape and from it you read what people think how people are or are not being civil or being good neighbor, neighbors. It connotes safety, a landscape that looks well, more well cared for, looks more safe, and importantly, it connotes marketability or productivity. The slide you see on the right is a productive agricultural landscape because it looks well cared for, it's assumed to be productive, but I could have shown you um, a, um, a residential development there that would look marketable, where the real estate value would be higher because of the appearance of care. So these are powerful connotations that relate to where, where is the visible evidence of care. So I wanna talk about what some of these characteristics of care are that I've learned from a whole series of studies. The most obvious is that a lack of neatness or order um, is a looks profoundly uncared for and uh, reduces the value of the landscape. Ironically, here you see a real uh, deeply disordered and uncared for landscape in the bottom in an area where I'm working on the Lower East Side of Detroit. 
Um, ironically, though, on the upper left, you see a very expensive home on the outskir outskirts of Ann Arbor. And it, ecologically, the cover isn't that much different. There are more natives in the upper, upper left than you have in, uh, I think that's Chalmers Street in, in Detroit. But nonetheless, it all it verges on uh, appearing unsafe and certainly not marketable because it does not look well cared for. Here are some elements that could change that. Creating an appearance of order, using at least some visible mowing, some highly visible turf, and uh, employing these very simple things, colorful flowers. Colorful flowers are really, really uh, extremely influential in the way people perceive landscapes. Of these uh, four images, the upper right and the lower left are actually part of ecological designs that are de part of green infrastructure. The other two are not, but in a way that's why I included them, that these same characteristics, some mowing, some well cared for structures, and even in Flint, some colorful flowers that aren't even real, they're plastic. Uh, but they're there showing that somebody's taking care of that place and consequently they're powerful. Other characteristics, neatly uh, uh, and crisply defined edges and rows as part of the visible landscape, and uh, clearly defined, clearly articulated boundaries. They're related, but they're somewhat different in connoting care and in particular ownership. And again, you see this in three designs in New Zealand, in St. Paul, Minnesota, and in Chicago that, uh, that beautifully embody storm green infrastructure and st stormwater management. But again, in Flint, in the upper left, the boundaries there are equally important. And actually, uh, to, just to make a point, they're important there in terms of long-term water quality because there's no dumping on that site. There's no dumping of who knows what they want to get rid of, usually oil and gas, paint, that doesn't happen there because there's a clearly defined boundary. And finally, the kind of easy one is employing signs and ornaments. And we've seen some wonderful examples of much more profound signs and ornaments here earlier this morning. But ornaments that connote that an area is habitat, signs that connote the human intention for the ecosystem services that are being provided, also help people to understand the intent of the landscape. So where do these ideas come from? Um, partly they come from my own research um, starting way back um, more than 30 years ago, but partly they come from lots and lots of other research and uh, subsequent to this that have supported these same ideas. But I wanted to just pick out a few studies to hit some highlights. First of all, we learned in an early study in the, um, I guess we did this actually in the late 80s, that. Uh, uh, th again, these are all studies, empirical studies, where we uh, serve you, survey hundreds of people, that we learned that about half of a front yard could be dedicated to cover other than turf, and it was still understood to be a beautiful, acceptable, marketable space. So half a front yard gives you a lot of leeway for employing green infra infrastructure, as long as that turf was visible. Subsequently, we did um, a... Uh, contingent valuation study with the economist Gloria Halfand, and we're pleased to see that uh, this was study was about 10 years later with a different larger exurban homeowner population, that people were willing to pay uh, about $125 more per month for, for either of the alternatives you see at the top. They were not willing to pay more for the alternative at the bottom with the woody shrub shrubby cover, but both of the alternatives at the top they were willing to pay more for than a conventional front yard. I thought we found that very interesting. I have to say that's partly because of the contingent valuation technique that requires that information be provided. So information that these uh, alternatives included biodiversity and had stormwater management services may have influenced what people said they were willing to pay more for. And then I find actually this one is, a, is the one we've uh, done most recently or published most recently and I find this one extremely encouraging for how we change pervasively across a watershed. In this one, we surveyed uh, more than 500 ex-urban homeowners in southeast Michigan. It was a really good random sample. And each of them saw a randomly assigned treatment of three images of what their neighbor's houses looked like. 
That's all, and we didn't tell them anything about it. If the three images they saw of their neighbors' houses were all conventional lawns, then the order of their preference looking at this sample down below, at, at the images down below for what they preferred for their own lawn, they clearly pre preferred a conventional lawn for themselves if all of their neighbors had conventional lawns. The mean was 598 out of 7 for that one. You can see the other two are lower at 4. Now another third of that 550 people saw um, only unconventional, ecologically innovative lawns. Next door, we just said, these are your neighbor's lawns, what do you prefer for yourself? Well, if, they, if you saw an ecologically innovative lawn, you rated the conventional yard for yourself much lower. You rated the uh, ecologically innovative yard the highest, 6.15 out of seven, and you rated the yard with mature trees about the same as before. Interestingly, and I'm not going to give you the numbers on this, but some people got a mixed treatment. They saw both conventional and ecologically innovative yards. Then the distribution was bimodal. About half of them really liked the conventional yard, and about half of them really preferred the ecologically innovative yard. So the scale at which innovations are uh, introduced really matters in their, I think, overall long-term community sustainability. And then this is a study we did some time ago. Again, all of these projects have been collaborative, as we've all said. But this is with a group of aquatic ecologists where we actually measured the water quality on first order watersheds, six of them, that had covers that were comparable to an equally ecologically innovative, lots of perennial cover, subdivision, a conventional subdivision, and conventional ag land in Michigan. So actually a sample of six. Briefly, what this shows is that those orange bars are measures of water quality and they represent agriculture. Agriculture is the worst, at least conventional agriculture in the Corn Belt, the worst for water quality. Again, unregulated by the Clean Water Act. The um, conventional by the gray bars is better than agriculture in the main and by far the best was the ecologically innovative approach. These green bars in the middle are the good news about cultural sustainability because regardless of whether you're a member of an environmental group or the general public, you prefer for yourself the ecologically innovative choice. Now, uh, I want to finish with just some examples of how we've applied these ideas. Uh, this was a project that we started in the early 90s across this entire watershed of seven municipalities working with the Ramsey-Washington Metro Watershed District. And I'll talk to you about the Maplewood project and the rainwater gardens there, but it really all started with a shopping center that was very troubled, and we proposed really as a, um, to be provocative, we, we proposed demolishing the shopping center where the elevation of the parking lot is 13 feet below the high water elevation of the upstream lake and building a wetland park there. And the short story is it's been built and it is beloved. And this is um, how it looked about five years ago. Uh, construction started in 97, I think. The city purchased the shopping center and uh, and if you want to learn more about how successful it was, so successful that the next mayor uh, uh, sold some of the park for um, market rate housing, you can read it there in places. But at the residential scale, this is where it seems to matter the most, both on Birmingham Street in Maplewood, where we developed these between 95 and 97, installed them in the summer of 97, and then later in the much denser Andersonville neighborhood of Chicago, our approach was just to try to interpret the vernacular aesthetics in, the way, in a way so that people would love them and maintain them and want them in their neighborhoods. One about the uh, Corn Belt uh, problem and vernacular aesthetics. Um, in this case, our initial alternatives included uh, an alternative that was best for water quality on the right. Um, and in our first group of small sample of farmers, they liked that but never thought it could happen. Later, we, inter we surveyed about 600 farmers, and you can read about this one there if you want, and we found a middle way that it had just enough corn, but 15 meters of perennial native, uh, a perennial native strip, 
between every 120 meters of corn, and everybody liked that one. So it, it's kind of finding that right combination that people can recognize as valuable. And we've employed these same principles in our study of Chicago brownfields and in a study of rural and metropolitan highway corridors. They seem to work. Um, I'll finish here by talking just a little bit about projects I've been doing in the last 10 years in Rust Belt cities, in post-industrial areas of Flint, Saginaw, and Detroit. What all of these cities have in common is a very high proportion of vacant properties. It makes, it makes any vacancy in Philadelphia you know, look, look like a thriving metropolis. It, you just can't quite understand it until you spend time in the neighborhoods where someone, maybe when they bought their house 10 years ago, there were 10 houses on their block, now they're the only one left. They're the only one left. The mortgage foreclosure situation made it even worse. So working with people to develop alternatives for when the city government really has no money for maintenance, people are leaving, people who are staying are underwater, they're in, tough, in a tough situation financially, it really matters to pay attention to what they can value. And when I first was asked to come to Flint, they thought I was going to give them an, an answer that had to do with just using lots of native plants all over where they it looked like all of these um, early six-sectional uh, uh, patches were springing up. But the more time I spent there, the more, time the more I felt that in Flint more than anywhere else, mowing mattered. It was the simplest thing that you could do to help people see that there wasn't trash, there wasn't dumping, and someone was showing up to do something. And so we developed a very selective mowing pattern that again was indicative of human presence. And I'll finish with this project that we've been working now for about, on for about two years on the Lower East Side in Detroit, where green infrastructure is very much the norm for Detroit sewer and water. It's the only thing they can afford to do, and they're trying to figure out how to do it. And I want to point out in, in this plan for, I think this is the, our, our type for at least nine vacant parcels together, so still a pretty well-occupied neighborhood. The planting pattern has to do with conveying safety by leaving a 75-foot uh, distance between the first row of trees and the second row, the fight or flight distance, because this is a neighbor where people are a neighborhood where people are very worried about strangers in the neighborhood and who might be coming by. Um, but I see with a little bit of grading and a lot of planting the opportunities for Detroit to alleviate CSOs with green infrastructure are enormous. So um, that's a sampling of many projects uh, and some research where that lead me to conclude that what is really going to be culturally sustainable respects what people value and the visible evidence of what they value now. And while law now requires us to pay attention to this for urban watersheds, it's needed perhaps even more for agricultural watersheds. That's really the next policy frontier. Thank you, Joan. I would love to follow up with all kinds of commentary, but I want to hand it over to the audience. So do we have any questions? Thanks. It's really uh, some wonderful work and very important. I'm wondering, I have two questions, if I may. One is, how, how do you do the visual assessment of this, and how do you, how do you get the reactions and, and categorize the answers? is the first question, and then completely unrelated, in some of the cities in the vacancies, have you found uh, any way to leverage particular areas so that for the biggest bang for the buck to, to continue the work? Yeah, oh, those are both really good questions. So about the methods we use in this empirical work, Often it is a, um, it, every, everyone is different, and as technology, technology has changed, our approach has changed, so we do a lot more web surveys now than we did in the past, but we nearly always start a project by doing um, a series of in-depth interviews that are more in situ with real places to understand what people are notice and are paying attention to. 
then based on that, so that's what, that's what we did in several of these projects, based on that, we develop alternative designs simulate them and and uh, show them uh, sort of we develop a factorial matrix of uh, alternative designs and show them to a large enough sample so that we can compare and contrast people's reaction and we also aim very high to get a sample of n not in any way to d dismiss the value of what you perceive in college but many many uh, environmental psychology experiments are done with whoever is in psych 101 <laughs> and uh, and we get, you know, real farmers, real homeowners, people who ha kind of have a sense of what's at stake in their choices as our, um, as our sample. Um, about the opportunities with vacant land, that's what I've really been thinking about the most, um, most recently. It's, a, it's a, such an important balance between the issues that several people have already spoken to today, between community engagement and what might be most efficient from the standpoint of cleaning stormwater. And, th and then some of the other ecosystem services you can stack on top of it, but cleaning stormwater as a lead. Um, the, the, the immediate goal right now in Detroit is to just give people who live in highly vacant neighborhoods, and highly vacant neighborhoods describes about one third of the city right now, the rest are just vacant. But, one third of the city is highly vacant, and the need is to give people a sense of control and safety in their own in their own environment. And frankly, like they're not about to be pushed out. And so, if you could enlist Detroit Sewer and Water to help give a sense of an orderly landscape, that seems to be the highest and best goal. What I think it's going to mean for the way the system actually works is that network systems are really going to matter because where you still have uh, a lot, or at least a, um, the highest proportion of impervious surface is not where you have the greatest vacant property. And so the network from one type to another is really gonna matter. Uh, Joan, thanks, for, that, was, that was wonderful and inspiring. Okay, thanks, I'll stand up. I'll, when Liza says stand up, we all stand up. Um, so it, perhaps many of us have experienced as students and professionals and academics this um, sense of what we know uh, causes a transition in our, our aesthetics. We know something's different, we see it differently, we appreciate things differently. Have you had a chance to try that out, to, to um, maybe engage in longitudinal research with communities doing um, uh, communities of, of learning, as, as they're called. Wenger talks about communities of practice or communities of learning, and see a shift in aesthetics so that you can advance the uh, ecological agenda perhaps faster than with what I'm seeing perhaps as some static um, values and aesthetics. Wh where's the role of community-based education in this? Is it possible? So the role of community-based education, I, I really like to quote Kevin Lynch on this. Uh, his observations deeply inform the way I thought about this initially and still think about it, which is, he, he said, the environment is an enormous communications device. So I, I do see every one of these designs as community education. Um, at, at, at the very least, we want people to see something they value and consequently to get engaged. I'll tell you a Maplewood story. I mean, the gardens in Maplewood, I hope, look um, pretty conventional. Uh, a little unusual, but pretty conventional. We used a plant palette that was primarily native, not entirely native, but what I hear from people who live in that neighborhood is they've been surprised at the butterflies. It's so, so, and their kids are interested in this. So there's been a level of, uh, curiosity about the landscape that's there. Frankly, I'm always, be because I've done so much re empirical research where we've parsed out people, say, who are in environmental disciplines or people who belong to environmental groups compared with others, um, I'm really very skeptical about a, an experimenter effect from projects in which people are given information and then they're supposed to respond with this information about uh, ecosystem services or biodiversity that comes with a certain design because we all like those things. So I think we really have to be careful looking at the environmental education literature to be somewhat skeptical about what people are saying people are going to like because they know what the benefits are 
compared with the tremendous, um, to use J.B. Jackson's words, pragmatic adaptation to circumstance. You know, this is my property, this is my school, this is my uh, shopping center. I'm going to manage it in, in a way that ultimately I expect to communicate with other people. So I, 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 think it's, um, I think it's an artful dance that we have to do between what we know and what we would like other people to know and appreciate. John. Thank you so much again for a great presentation. I've enjoyed your work with uh, the visual preference surveys. Um, those surveys that have been done have been primarily um, a lower density residential scale. Now the work that I've done over the years is highly urban, where you know, the, the, the urban environment is 90, almost 100% impervious, so people aren't even used to seeing landscape at all. So I could see extreme value in uh, helping um, just with the general perception of adding green in in our downtown or even you know lesser densities than that um, is there an interest or do you see a need to to move to that uh, hmm. that realm too to because i i come across a lot of resistance um, trying to implement even the smallest areas of landscape in an, in an urban area um, because of a host of different reasons. And so I'm wondering if something like what you've done in the past with these other residential areas would be helpful. That's so interesting to hear. I, I would really like to know more about some of the objections that you encounter. Um, I, I frankly have assumed, and I guess I've been wrong about this, I've assumed that um, an, an urban area that has a lively real estate market, given all of the uh, incentives for clean water improvements that it, it would not be a difficult sell to introduce uh, green infrastructure and landscape but you're telling me that was a wrong assumption 